Hi, my name is Daniel Malik and I am here with Maria Rodriguez from VSTS team. Hi Maria, how are you? I'm doing great. How about you? Yeah, yeah I'm fine. So tell me Maria, you've been with the Microsoft team for quite a while. It's been since how many? Two, yeah, 2005? So, um, I actually joined Microsoft in 2002 uh, and I worked in the Xbox group. So right out of college, you know, working in Xbox playing games is pretty, pretty nice. Uh, in fact, what I'm wearing today is PGR, which is Project Gotham <laughs> Racing, uh, uh, which is a game. Uh, but then after that, I decided that I wanted to move into software development tools and join Brian Harry's team in North Carolina uh, in the first version of the product. So I've been with him now since 2005. Uh, which has been great. So I started in version control. Um, then from there, I moved into uh, our cloud platform. So what it took to actually ship Team Foundation, um, um, Team Foundation Service, and then what became Visual Studio Online, and it's now Team Services or Visual Studio or VSTS as we call it. Uh, so it's been a, a good journey. Um, recently kind of moved uh, also to take care of uh, a team called a package management team um, to really take into the space of source and binary uh, code sharing uh, and consumption. Can you tell me a bit more about this? I mean, you have quite impressive history. I mean, you've been with a company for 14 years doing some cool stuff, and I believe that must be the next big thing for you. So tell me a bit about more about package management, why, what it is and why should people care about it? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, so, you know, Team Foundation Service is, is a set of kind of vertical services. Um, you have version control with Git at TFVC. Uh, you have our CI and CD pipeline, continuous integration, continuous delivery. And then you have our agile tooling, right? Um, what, as, as we went deeper into this DevOps journey, we realized that there was a space that we actually were not um, having an offering uh, to be able to help our customers succeed. And that was the actual consumption and generation of packages. And um, you know, teams are no longer building these monolithic applications. You know, microservices as a world is something very prominent. Um, and teams are actually, you know, consuming a lot of open source packages. They're doing more frameworks that get used in the microservices. So there's kind of this movement to do more source sharing and binary sharing at the end. Um, and, and that world is complex. Uh, and you do need a set of services and tools to make sure that you're successful. Uh, you know, a set of our customers, when we were visiting them, they had file shares to actually share between teams instead of binaries. That, that is not very reliable, you know, has a bunch of performance problems. Um, and that's why you see products out there, um, you know, like Artifactory by JFrog, Nexus has a pretty good set of products, ProGet and others, MyGet, trying to actually offer a service that provides you a way to put packages into it and, you know, either secure them appropriately, scale them appropriately, meaning if you have a thousand developers trying to get them, and then be able to provide kind of some uh, aggregation and filter capabilities on that too. So um, for us, we're thinking, you know, as we continue on this DevOps journey, uh, binary and source sharing will be very, very uh, important. And we need to make sure that we provide tools um, to our, you know, software teams to make them successful. That's really where package management comes in is, I have this thing that is a component, it's in binary form, how can we let you effectively share that component across the organization and with the people that need to consume them? So let me see if I get this right. Yes. So if I am working in a company and I don't want some packages to be consumed because they're potentially malicious or they, they, they're not you know, fitting the licensing standards that we were supposed to use, that's where package management comes in. Yeah, so what you talk about is one area of the product that we call component governance as well. Um, even before you even get to component governance, you, you still have these package producers, these framework teams that need to actually generate these packages and share them with their consumers. And they need a way to actually put that in a central location for them to consume it. They need a way to say, hey, this is the stable copy that you should consume. They need a way to um, you know, express the ability um, to actually say these are my dependencies and a bunch of other things. So package management really comes in when you, you, you're you having something that you want to share out, but it's no longer the source, it's really the binary of that. And you're cons you need a set of life cycle things to be able to make your consumers great. In addition to that is what you said as well is, I'm an enterprise. All of my developers are consuming these packages. Some are internal, some are external. And in those external packages, what is my risk? 
from a governance perspective. And we see three main risks. Actually, we see the uh, what we call licensing risk, meaning you know you were mentioning my maybe my organization is great uh, on MIT is perfectly fine, but I don't want to have any GPL kind of licenses in, in the stuff that I'm consuming from externally from the open source world. You know, there will be features then I give you the ability to filter those packages, recognize those packages and things like that. Then there is what we call security risk. Hey, maybe there's a secure vulnerability that happened. How can you actually make sure that um, you could identify those things and remain compliant? So package management also has uh, a governance part to it, but um, we see it as three verticals. Uh, one of them is what we call package life cycle, and that is I am the producer of the package. I need to you know, code that package, build the package, package the package, and then release the package. And then even after that is learn about the consumers and what they're doing with my package. So that's one vertical of package management that we see. Another vertical of package management is what we call package consumption and dependency. Let's say you don't produce any package, but you're bringing in 100 packages that you're consuming from either other teams in your organization and externally in open source. Um, how can you do that effectively? How can you not get yourself into diamond dependencies that cause you to, to be very inflexible? Uh, what is diamond dependency? Yeah, so diamond dependencies is, um, it's a beautiful thing, you know, diamonds are really, 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 really pretty, uh, very shiny, and but they get you into a lot of trouble. <laughs> so really it's, um, let's say you have a, a package A, uh, or some project, right, A, that is bringing a set of packages, but let's say it's a package A, B and C actually consume A, and then you have D at the bottom, so at the end you form this diamond. So you have A, B, C, D. And usually what you see is, let's say this um, package A is bringing in Newton Soft, um, you know, let's say 1.8 or something like that. B and C are consuming A and D too. Well, but let's say A actually revved up Newton Soft to be 1.9. B consumed that new version of A, but C hasn't consumed the new version of A. Well, D now is in trouble because now D is actually consuming Newton of 1.9 because B updated its dependency, oh. but uh, C did not. And then at runtime, you get failures and your system breaks and all of those type of things. Now, that's a very simple diamond. If you actually think about your entire dependency graph, that thing could be very complicated. And that's what we see big enterprises struggle with binary consumption. So there's a lot of good stuff that we could do to make sure that um, from a you know, package dependency and consumption, we really help you be successful as a team. And then the third pillar, it's uh, component governance like we're talking about. So life cycle, dependency, and governance. Those are the main three pillars of package management and the way we see it. So very excited, we're, we're, we're kind of very new right now. Um, you know, kind of, um, we, we're j we just released uh, package management GA as part of our Connect uh, announcements. So um, and initially we were only in the NuGet space, now we extended our protocol uh, support to also do NPM. So now we have NuGet and NPM support, uh, and we're very excited about the team is um, you know, really stoked to be able to deliver that uh, as part of this Connect event. That's great, so c can you, are you, do you have any plans to extend that anywhere further to like Bower or you know, any other package? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a that's a great question. We get asked that a lot, uh, as you could imagine, because from a package management perspective, you get the majority of the value by having the most protocol support. Um, and you know, to tell you the truth, we're kind of listening to our customers. Um, you know, and be able to be able to react at the end to it. Um, our thinking right now is we're gonna go ahead and focus on the. the pretty much top popularity protocol. So Bower that you mentioned is one of those type of things, you know, that we're looking at. Um, another one that um, comes up um, a lot might be like PowerShell modules, uh, Shockley, um, uh, things like Homebrew for the Mac is another one. Um, Docker is another one that we get asked a lot. Uh, Maven and Ivy for the uh, um, Java world. So what we end up doing is we prioritize that. We continue to talk to customers and then um, we go ahead and try to figure out how to actually resource to bring that package protocol out. Um, 
you know, if you ask me right now, we have two more coming in the pipeline. Um, I cannot tell you what those are right now, but, okay. uh, but um, there are two more in the pipeline that we are going to be uh, releasing. Uh, hopefully, we'll make an announcement in the ALM blog or in Brian's blog. We still haven't figured out um, of the next two that are in the pe pipeline um, and what we're going to do there. Uh, but yes, we're going to be, think about it, we're going to be constantly adding uh, the ones that are popular on our customer set and to make sure that, you know, we could really um, make them successful. That, that's very promising and very awesome, but tell me when, I, when can I get all this? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, uh, the timing question stuff. But um, so, like I told you, we just announced GA. Um, we're not only that, we announced- Sorry, what is GA? Yeah, general availability. Oh, okay, yes. It's what we, um, so that just means, hey, it's no longer in preview. P, you know, there's uh, support, there's an SLA that goes with that. We also um, announced that in TFS 2017, package management can be used. Uh, so um, you could get a lot of these features now, kind of thing. Uh, in in, in on-premises, it's only new get, um, but um, we'll, come, we'll be coming up in update one, update two with NPM support. Uh, but on the cloud, we already have now NuGet and NPM. The other protocols will, will follow, you know, um, again, as we figure out a way to kind of space them so we get the customer feedback and things like that. But we have other features coming up that we're very uh, excited about. And, you know, we ship every three weeks on the service. So customers can expect a uh, significant amount of value every three weeks um, coming out there. So uh, one thing that we're also releasing very shor shortly is this thing called release views, um, that it's a very innovative feature from our end. Um, uh, I'll tell you what the scenario is that we think we fulfill a little bit on that. Um, so traditionally, if I'm a package producer, and we're talking about all of these verticals, right? Um, as I'm a package producer, I end up producing this package and I need to test it and I need before I actually release it more broadly. And usually what happens is this package producer will then, you know, produce a package and push it into a feed or into a repository that is their alpha or beta, right? And then after they, someone consumes it from that feed, um, after they kind of pass all the tests, then they go in and push the same package um, to another feed and um, as well and, and kind of manage two, three, four feeds, depending on how many actual quality rings they have at the end. And then what other other people do is they don't actually have multiple feeds, but they end up adding dash, you know, alpha, dash, beta, and it's what new yeah. codes pre-release. Um, and they kind of do those things and manage it. But we heard a lot of complexity from our customers on that. You don't want to manage for feeds or repositories um, and, and things like that. You want to have one endpoint, and then you want to yeah. just have a promotion model in that endpoint. And that's what release views give you. Release views allows you to have one endpoint by being able to say, uh, have these filter views on the packages on that endpoint. So I can just pu push a package and, um, and label it in the, uh, not label it, but push it into the, and say promote it into the alpha uh, release view. And all of my customers that co are consuming alpha can consume them safely, but all of my release doesn't, you know, they never see that alpha version. So now we give you one place to manage everything from a kind of your life cycle perspective, um, but be very explicit about, okay, what's the quality of this package? And, um, and now your consumers can actually consume one feed and one endpoint and be very sure about the quality they're receiving out of that. So that's an innovative feature that we have. Uh, not, you know, none of our competitors have it. Um, so we're very excited about that. We're just starting with it right now. Um, I think we push it to our um, stage zero and stage one, eventually makes it into all the other ones um, as well. Another feature that we're working on that we're very excited that we're gonna continue delivering value to our customers is this feature called Upstreams. And um, very simple, but a lot of value to our own premises and a lot of value. So, so, so what is this uh, Upstreams? Yeah. So think about, um, again, this whole, this whole thing is about We've seen a lot of our customers go towards one feed instead of or one repository instead of managing multiple. Um, it's just simpler for them. It allows them to actually do you know filtering and a bunch of other value add that they get out of it. So um, what upstreams allow you to do is again you have one feed that your all of your developers are consuming packages from. But not only that, now you could actually um, upstream a, a, a public registry like npm.js for example, 
right? So now with just one feed, you could ask it, I want to install this package that is not local in that feed right now. It's in NPMJS. But the feed can, because it knows there's an upstream, can go into that upstream, retrieve the package, oh. and then give it to that developer. So the developer doesn't have to, specifically in NPM, doesn't have to have separate NPM RCs of going back and forth to actually retrieve private and public packages. Just one place for them to consume their private stuff and their public stuff in a very seamless manner. Now, we go even further on that and say, OK, now we actually not only going to go ahead and give you the package developer, we're going to cache it in that feed as well. So if your build machine and your other 100 developers are asking the question, I want package foo at version 1.1.1, we don't have to go to the upstream anymore to serve that up, right? We could just give you that right there. And, you know, we have a set of customers that are very, you know, they have firewall rules and a bunch of things like that. And they're, they're very careful about how many people they want to allow out to get things and come in that traffic in. You know, in one customer, they had 1,000 developers and making 10,000 calls, essentially, because one NPM <laughs> package might bring in another 50 of them, right? So. Um, but if they're cached in, internally by this feed, now you don't have to go um, every time to actually get it from the public registry. The public registry is down. You don't, you know, to a degree you don't care that much because you could actually get it from the cache as well. So it just gives you a bunch of usability, you know, reliability, performance improvements. Um, and then eventually we're going to be able to attach to that this governance stuff that you've been talking about. Uh, so be able to say, hey, I don't want GPL licenses from there, or very simple filters. Think about it that way. Um, those are things that will come in the future. Uh, but this, this feature that we're doing upstreams allows us to do that. Uh, so that's another one that we're pretty excited about delivering uh, in a kind of shortly um, kind of next year. That, that's great. So my, my final question to you is, yeah. All good things are coming in, so you're going to have component governance, you're going to have upstreams. You're going to be able to predict what's the quality of the, the next version, right? So do you think you'll be able to upgrade packages in a solution automatically so that I don't have to do that as a developer? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, uh, some of that requires actually integration with the CSPROSH file and all of those type of things. but. Um, you touched on a very good point. You know, I, I've been talking about, hey, there's three pillars to uh, package management. Um, there's package lifecycle, which we talk about upstreams and uh, release views and all those type of things. Well, I'm sorry, release views is really about package lifecycle. Then there's package um, dependencies and consumption. And we talk about upstreams as one of those features. But another set of features is what you're saying is, hey, there's this dependency graph. And mm -hmm. sometimes when I want to bring in a new package, I have to do so much work to be able to get it across all of the projects that they are and things like that. And you know, we um, this is not something that we could solve alone, but um, we're um, we're working with the new get. Well, actually, the new get team is very aware of those things, and they're working on ideas around that problem. We're also working on ideas around that problem in a protocol agnostic way, um, but not nothing there that is solid or anything that we could share. But we understand the pain, um, and what I could say is, you know, we're gonna be we're gonna be taking a look, a very very hard look at the scenarios that have to do with package consumption. Um, and dependencies and try to see where we could innovate and where we could actually add the most value. If it is that, if it is something slightly different, mm -hmm. we'll figure out. And then on component governance, we're really you know, looking at partnerships right now. Um, we, you know, we're working with White Source, we're working with Black Duck, um, working with other companies um, to try to figure out, hey, how can we actually integrate with partners something in, in that space so you could do the right thing at an enterprise level. So, but the majority of our focus over the next six months will really be in package lifecycle and package consumption. And you know, if we get that feature or other features that allow you to do cool stuff on the graph, like diamond dependency management and visualizations and things like that, that that's, that's probably where we'll spend a little bit more of our time. Thank you, Mario. That was a really great conversation. Thanks for your time. And this is Daniel Malik signing off for SSW TV.